What a freaking rad, incredible human being I have on the show for you guys today. Her name is Dr. Maya Shitri. She is a neurologist, herbalist, urban farmer, and author of The Dirt Cure and The Master Plant Experience, The Science, Safety, and Sacred Ceremony of Psychedelics. Okay, so we have a MD neurologist coming into, now has written a book this year in 2023 about um, psychedelics and plant experiences. So she's gonna share how she kind of went into that direction. Um, and she's sharing a lot of really just cool science backed information, um, really cool blending of like her own experience and honoring that and being open blended with like, okay, what is the actual data that we have here and what have we learned? And it's just so amazing. She's been featured in the New York times, the telegraph, NPR, sky news, the Dr. Oz show and more. She is the founder of the Terrain Institute, where she teaches earth-based programs for transformational healing, including professional training programs for psychedelic assisted approaches. She works and studies with indigenous communities and healers from around the world and is a lifelong student of ethnobotany, plant healing, and the sacred. So if you're into these kind of things or you're a little bit interested, please listen. Such an amazing episode. She's so well-spoken and I just enjoyed every minute. We'll go ahead and jump in. Here is Dr. Maya Sheetreat. Okay, so Dr. Maya, you've got a new book out about psychedelics and your background is as an MD, a neurologist, um, a pediatric neurologist, correct? So you went this MD neurology route, which I love. I'm a little obsessed with neurology and neurotransmitters and all that kind of stuff. And now you're talking about, you've written a book with about psychedelics. It's super science backed. I think you said you had over like 700 references in there or something like that on an interview I heard you talking about. And you also in the past have written a book about the microbiome and the gut and dirt, the dirt cure. Right. And now you've branched into publishing this one about psychedelics. And this whole thing is just like, I'm looking at your trajectory of your career and I'm like, good for her. Good for her. <laughs> like she just is, she's free. She's just like, we're going to just talk about the stuff that is actually like making a huge change in people. And that really matters. And like, you've really, I, I just have to give you kudos for like, just following your heart and your soul and speaking up and showing up. So Thank you for doing that. And thank you for coming and sharing with us today. And, well, um, pleasure. Yeah. And so let's start, let's start with psychedelics. And my audience knows that, uh, that's a huge part of my life. Very gra grateful. You know, um, I forget sometimes that this is still something that some people out there like think are like bad, you know, and like have this, like that's drugs and can't believe you're talking about this taboo subject. Like I forget that sometimes. Cause like kind of in my world, like there's so many people I know who are so incredibly grateful. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to get your, um, voice as a doctor, you know, talking about why you decided to write a book about this. <laughs> well, so it's interesting. I mean, when you say, Oh, like following your heart and, you know, talking about these things, it's sort of, for me, my journey has sort of left me no choice. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but uh -huh. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's like you're, you're pulled kicking and screaming and I am sometimes that person. And, um, you know, I would say, I always say that's my relation. My was, that was my relationship, um, with psychedelics period was, kind of getting pulled kicking and screaming. And what I mean by that is even the very first time I went to Ecuador, so my son had been sick. So my mm -hmm. first book, The Dirt Cure, was actually instigated by my son being sick at a year of age. And, you know, it took me into this whole journey around his gut and around gut health and food and how food is grown, things that at that time really not many people were talking about. Mm -hmm. It was not all over, you know, Instagram. No. Instagram was not a thing um, at that time, for example, right, when I was going through all of that. And ultimately, I ended up writing The Dirt Cure. Then, you know, my son was about seven years old and um, we had had mold in our apartment. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was a whole journey. Anyone who's dealt with mold or mold in an apartment building, especially, I mean, mm -hmm. you're dealing with co-op boards and neighbors and mm -hmm. big money and insurance companies. And it was just an ordeal. And we had to mm. move out of our apartment for five months while they were gutting the area where there was mold. And we got rid of everything. We got rid of 
uh, stuffed animals, upholstered furniture. We got everything cleaned. Like, you know, the doorways, everything was cleaned with toothbrushes. Like literally it was tested negative, negative. And we moved back in and two weeks later, my seven-year-old son who had been on all the food things, all the supplement things, all the herbs, right? I was an integrative adult and pediatric neurologist. Um, he had a seizure, he had a first time seizure. And he wow. had that first time seizure in the room that had been the epicenter of the mold, but wow. there was no mold. It had been gutted to the wow. studs. Okay. It was absolutely clean, new shower tiles, you know, the whole thing. Wow. So I'm there holding my little seven-year-old son and I'm like, right, and I'm a neurologist and I'm thinking, you know, I'm the person maybe one of the only people in the world at that time, there were not other integrative pediatric neurologists for sure. Um, there were barely any integrative adult neurologists. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not a physical problem. I know I am doing all of the things for his physical body. And I know this is, it's energetic, it's, it's mm -hmm. spiritual, it's soul sickness. It's something mm -hmm. I have no idea how to do, how to address, I just don't know. I just don't know. And I don't even know who to ask. Mm. And I knew it with my entire body. And so for people who have known something like that, right, we're taught mm -hmm. to know things in our minds and mm -hmm. very thinky about things and be rational. Like sometimes, you know, something in your body mm -hmm. because your whole body is intelligent. Right. And we can get mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. But um, but that said, I then had to really find spiritual teachers. I mean, that's what ended up happening. And again, no interest. I was not like, oh, let me go to Ecuador, right? I mean, that was not what was on my mind. I was like, I need to find people who are going to help my son. And, um, you know, I have a whole story. One day I'll tell it, you know, maybe in a memoir or something about like, I went to the teachers, I was turned away. I had to come back again. I was turned away, right? It was very wow. mythical, a very mythical <laughs> kind of experience, hero's journey type stuff. And um, ultimately one of the places I went was to a herbal conference in New Hampshire where there was a fourth generation shaman who I had met at a different herbal conference and learned from a little bit. And she was, I knew going to be doing healings there. And I thought they would not promise I could see her. I mean, you know, they made it like incredibly, incredibly difficult and scary to drive <laughs> eight hours with a sick kid, but I did. And it was incredible. It was incredible. I, she did this healing on him and he was totally different afterwards. Like she cleaned him with plants and with eggs and with candles and all of these things. And, and she, he was different and she cleaned me. She cleaned my daughter who also came and we were like laughing the entire way home. Like we mm. were driving back and we were, we couldn't stop laughing. We were so light. It was like wow. a very profound experience for me. I mean, especially as a neurologist, right? It wasn't like I was so serious or anything, but like, I would have never thought I'd, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could feel really the shift in energy. And um, I said to this, you know, shaman, um, I said, do you ever teach any of these techniques? And she said, yeah, I have people come to Ecuador, you know, in the spring, I'll be doing a, a, a trip in Ecuador, check my website. And she gives me some web address, which I then check later. It's not a website. It was not a website. It was like a page and it didn't have any information on it. And I keep, <laughs> checking it, I keep checking it. I keep checking it. Nothing. Then I don't know, a couple of months go by. I check it again. And the trip is the next week. Oh my goodness. Suddenly I'm like, Oh my God. So all of it happened like, boom, very quickly. I ended up somehow figuring out how to leave my three small children for a few weeks, wow. uh, very, very quickly. I, I never could have imagined it happening, but it did to go to a country I'd never been, that spoke a language I did not speak, people I had never met on this trip. And I I had to wire the money literally within 24 hours and I went on this trip and, um, you know, I knew we were going to be learning about some of those plants and learning from a lot of indigenous teachers, which we did. Um, but nobody said we we're going to be consuming any of them. They didn't say that anywhere. So mm -hmm. I got there and, you know, we're doing our thing oh, day by day in the jungle and then in the mountains. And they're like, oh, you know, we're going to be drinking ayahuasca, you know, tomorrow. And um, I was really freaked out, honestly. I'm like, I'm a neurologist. <laughs> I'm a mother. I'm like 
you know, we were three hours away, even from the closest tiny town that probably didn't even have a hospital. Honestly, I don't even know if it did. That was like an air, an airplane ride to actually probably where there was. And I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, am I completely crazy? Um, and actually that ayahuasca experience was very nil for me. And I think it's because mm. I was like with her, I'm not ready for this. Mm. But then the next week we were in the mountains and um, we had a San Pedro experience. And that experience uh, to this day is the most profound experience I would say I've had. And mm. I've had other bigger journeys since then, although I don't really do big journeys anymore. I don't need to, I'm very, mm -hmm. You know, I have a lot to unpack, but I've never drank San Pedro again. I grow San Pedro, I grow ayahuasca, but I don't consume them because um, I feel like I'm still unpacking that journey yeah. from over yeah. a decade ago. And wow. it would be greedy for me to go back to a master teacher. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about master plants because I don't even really talk so much about psychedelics as I do about master plants. Nice. Um, for me to go back to a master and say, Hey, I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. Right. When I haven't even finished what you already told me. Right. And that ended up becoming this book, even this book that nice. I wrote, um, you know, the, the person who was kind of coaching me, uh, I was working on a different book and she said, I really think you should write a book about psychedelics. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. It's not my thing. And then I'm like, you know what, maybe I'll write a little, book to go along with the course I teach. And that'll mm -hmm. be really quick, just short. It ended up being an 85,000 word book that was truly going to the underworld and coming back. Mm -mm -mm. So I love this because I, I'd say there's a lot of us in our community, if you will, of like, it's like science meets spirituality, which is kind of like the same thing. It's it, to me, it feels like science is like trying to figure out science is trying to figure it out. Like it, spirituality, I guess, for lack of a better word, is just like reality, like what's already exists in the plane. Right. And I think that you're, um, brave, you know, and, um, intelligent, quite frankly, to be able to get out of the box of like, I know everything. I have all the facts. I need proof for everything. And to like bravely allow yourself to expand your way of thinking without having all of the facts and any of us who have had sacred plant medicine journeys like it's just you know it's funny you hear people have like strong opinions about it and they've never done it and it's just like you know um I don't mean to be an asshole, but like, if you've never experienced it and you're judging it, like you literally have no idea what you're talking about. Like, you just can't know. It's like me judging like NBA players. I'm like, I don't know how to, I've never been an NBA player. Why am I judging that? You know? And I'm, I'm so profoundly grateful to the plants and you hit on something so incredibly important uh, that integration piece that anyone who, you know, had really d dove, dived, dove in. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak English into this world. It like understands that I hopefully understands that, you know, I was just like, I I'll do it again when I feel called to, but until then, like I I've never felt called back to ayahuasca. And once you kind of get in these circles, people will ask you all the time, Oh, these amazing shamans are coming from wherever. And I'm like, no, nah, dude, because this between me and her and like, she is not calling me back. So I'm not going to go do that again when I don't feel that intuitively, I wait for that, you know, but it's so powerful. But can we have you maybe share for people who haven't experienced it? And they're like, I'm not being judgy. I'm actually open. Like, can you share, you know, cause now we have, we, we've got Johns Hopkins and we've got all these universities studying plant medicines, you know, can you share some valuable insights um, that I'm sure you wrote about in your book, you know, for people who want a little bit more of that science backing, which, you know, rightfully so, can you share some insights from the book that might be interesting to people? Sure. Yeah. And I want to say something actually, if it's okay, just to unpack for a moment, um, you know, you talk about science and spirituality for one thing, right. Is like, the, the spiritual language and the language of science are languages. They're all languages that describe the unknown. Yeah. And right. there are just different ways of coming into contact with the unknown and making the unknown um, or mystery feel less 
scary and yeah. intimidating, right? right. And totally. we become very focused on the science language, which I love. I am mm -hmm. very happy to nerd out about science as much as people will let me, mm -hmm. um, but it's just one language. And it's only become the fully predominant, the only language in you know the last few hundred years. For millennia, it, there were many other languages. And mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one thing I wanna mention. Another thing is about science. Um, and I think it's relevant to what you were saying about me as a doctor, but also other people um, who are like, oh, that, you know, that's terrible, that's a drug, and they don't you know, really know that much about it except what they were told. Is one thing that we've done in our society and used science to do is to say, you cannot believe your own eyes. It must be written, it must be proven, it yeah. must be right. And so if you see something, you're, people, you know, and doctors will do this all the time, say that's impossible, or that couldn't have happened, right? right? Like, like yeah. you're like, but that's my body or, you know, or yeah. I saw that, right? And be told that's not true. It's like, well, right? And so there's yeah. this way in which we don't trust ourselves because mm -hmm. science, because science, right? And that's mm -hmm. not because of science. It's just, it's how science is used mm -hmm. in a kind of weaponized way sometimes in a disempowering way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second thing. Now, the third thing is, what's the science behind psychedelics? Because the science behind psychedelics is really, really profound. And um, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean, by the way, right, when you said, she doesn't want me back, you were referring to ayahuasca, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Ayahuasca, which which um, people might might or might not have realized. But, um, but something really important that I think the science is showing is that these experiences the psychedelic experiences or the experiences we have with these master plants like ayahuasca like san pedro like magic mushrooms quote unquote right the psilocybe mushrooms and on and on they're relationships they are relationships they're interactions mm -hmm. and they are relationships they're not compounds you know going to your neurotransmitters as as the way they work and that's why you're like she's mm -hmm. not calling me like you start to understand and this is very common language not around things like lsd or mdma which are synthetic but mm -hmm. around plants totally. and right totally. where they'll say oh ayahuasca told me or or the mushrooms uh showed me you know and it's not the same if somebody has mdma for example for ptsd or whatever right. um they won't say MDMA told me. And I've talked to, you know, totally. people, they'll say, I, while I was on MDMA, I, I realized like during right. my journey, I realized, but they won't say so I was true. shown, I was told. Right. So that's right. just another point is this is a relationship. And I always mm. say to people, you know, just because I'm about to tell you all these amazing things about what psychedelics and master plants can do and how they can help us heal in many cases, and I do think they are in many cases life saving, literally life saving in addiction and depression in eating disorders and on. Um, I would also say. It's important to. Feel the call, right? Don't yeah. don't run out and do this because you think you should or because it sounds so good. It's like you feel like drawn if you feel right, then the first mm -hmm. thing I say is go look at go look at pictures of the plant, go read a little nice. bit about the plant, right? Start mm -hmm. to like cultivate intimacy with the plant before you're like, I'm going to go do this thing and trip. You know what I mean? And right. I'm not knocking, you know, I'm not knocking that. I know right. for some people that's like their whole thing. And that's, that's cool. I'm just saying in general, from my perspective as a neurologist mm -hmm. and as a guide and as a ceremonialist and someone mm -hmm. who walks in many worlds, mm -hmm. um, I think, cultivating that intimacy, mm -hmm. right? The medicine's already happening when you feel that interest, that longing, that mm -hmm. deep curiosity, and that's, it's already happening. It's already happening. Mm -hmm. So as far as the science goes, you know, right now, and you heard me give a little bit of a uh, teaser there, but <clears throat> you know, what's been really exciting is that many, many academic centers now around the world, I would say most prestigious academic centers have either centers that study psychedelics or really concerted, um, you know, clinical research trials going on. And these trials have been so far um, showing great success for addiction. And when I say addiction, I'm talking about alcohol addiction, 
cigarette addiction and and others right all the many other addictions that you can imagine very severe addictions that people have a very hard time breaking like heroin or you know um, methamphetamine or other things right that they these medicines help them you know and sometimes in just one or two doses now i also want to be clear every single study i'm referring to has clinical professional support before during and after I'm yeah. not saying, you know, <laughs> go in your backyard and do, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not saying that can't be helpful, right? right. I'm sure that it can be, but if we're talking about studies, we're talking about trials, mm -hmm. we're talking about the science, these outcomes are hand in hand with support, professional mm -hmm. support before, during, and after. Mm -hmm. um, so addiction, intractable depression, right? Depression that is not responded to other things, OCD, PTSD, Mm -hmm. uh, just as some examples, trauma, including sexual trauma, eating mm -hmm. disorders, and now it's being looked at for autoimmunity, for dementia, for traumatic brain injury, right? Mm -hmm. So concussions, but terrible concussions sometimes, right? Like athletes, a lot of athletes are now coming forward because they have experienced these huge benefits that have come along with psychedelics mm -hmm. uh, after suffering severe damage, mm -hmm. literally from traumatic brain injury. So um, so the science as far as benefit has been profound. A lot of the studies have been done in big doses, one or two even, you know, and they see benefit. We're starting to see a lot more studies on microdosing. Microdosing mm -hmm. is what we would call a sub psychedelic dose, meaning you don't, you don't trip, right? Mm -hmm. You're not like incapacitated for, mm -hmm. you know, hours. Um, you're able to do your life, you mm -hmm. know, if you're, if you're at a real microdose, you should be able to, you know, go to work, take care of your kids, you know, go to get mm -hmm. groceries, whatever you need to do. Um, but you're experiencing some of the neuroplasticity, right? The new connections that are happening in your brain and other benefits that unfold over time. So microdosing is something you would do over time, over you know a month or months or longer. And there's been already studies. So microdosing is a little harder to study in an academic setting mm -hmm. because in a lot of places psychedelics are still not legal. Right. And so when you know you can't send people out into the world. Uh, in an academic study and be like, here, take this, you know, what we still call a schedule one substance, even though mm -hmm. it shows, it shows that you recover from addiction, not it causes addiction, right, which is usually what would define a schedule one substance, um, just because the law is taking time to catch up, and they want to mm -hmm. make sure I think rightly mm -hmm. want to make sure that there's the right infrastructure mm -hmm. and education for preparation, mm -hmm. the experience itself and integration and that involves a lot of people right and a lot of people being educated uh to mm -hmm. understand what they're dealing with um but microdosing is showing a lot of potential for autoimmunity for mm -hmm. asthma for gut issues like nice. Crohn's, colitis and so on mm -hmm. even um we're seeing it also for chronic pain migraines cluster headaches that kind of thing mm -hmm. um I mean, trigeminal neuralgia, which is, you know, some of those pain conditions are are literally so severe they can drive people to suicide because the treatments are not really that adequate. And we're seeing benefit. We're seeing benefit, right? We're looking at Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS. All of these conditions are right now being explored in terms of microdosing. So I think I think my gut is we're gonna see microdosing being actually the real player mm. as far as how these are going to be the most valuable and accessible to the largest number of people um, mm. from a medical standpoint. That's my that's my guess. Um, and then finally, there's quantum dosing, and that is its own story. But working with the medicine vibrationally, which I never really thought was a thing, but it turns out there is a precedent to this, which is uh, anyone who's been in ayahuasca ceremony has experienced something called Ikaros. Ikaros are these medicine songs and they're not made up by the maestro, the ayahuasquero who's running the ceremony, although they're the ones who sing it, they're actually considered to be transmitted, transmitted mm -hmm. medicine, right? Vibrational transmissions of the master plant, of the ayahuasca that's given to this ayahuasquero when they diet, learn from the plant. And then these songs are 
considered to be as potent as drinking the medicine. And anyone who's been in ceremony with someone who's sung Icaros will know that, you know, you'll hear this particular um, song and start to feel like you need to vomit, right? Or you'll feel like you want to cry and cry and cry, or you'll feel like, oh, I'm coming into my body. I'm calmer, right? They're medicine, they're potent medicine. And there's some ayahuasqueros that don't even give the medicine to drink to people in their ceremony. They drink the medicine and then they sing the Icaros and the people still have these experiences, these healing mm-hmm. experiences. So, um, so there are a lot of ways to engage in quantum with these medicines as well. And I grow them, as I said, and that's my service to them, my tending, but also I receive a lot of teachings through nice. doing that. The cover of my book is actually a picture of a slice of ayahuasca. I'll just show it really quickly so people can see it's sacred geometry. It's very, very mm. profound and beautiful. This is just a photograph. And that's quant- that's a quantum dose, right? There's a way in which you've established a relationship and received something from the ayahuasca plant when you look at the cover, right? And then there are other things which I've developed, um, these vibrational medicines called quantum drops, which are a way to orally cultivate that intimacy on a vibrational level. And it's been very profound to see that. Mm, wow. So many beautiful things there. And I just have to really highlight the, I love what you were sharing about the Icaros and the sounds and vibrations and, you know, and, and, and these quantum drops, that's what you're hitting on. And, um, I, so biohacking is part biohacking is a term we use, right. But it's really just like understanding how things are impacting your physiology from your thoughts all the way to your environment, to your, you know, air quality, to your food and all that kind of stuff. And I think that sound is one of the most powerful ones there is. And like, we all know that already. Like if I put some, like, classic song that makes everybody just want to start getting down. Like all of a sudden that frequency comes in and you're like dancing, you're totally. And then you put some sad, like Garth Brooks heartbreak song on your sad, you know, I don't really listen to the country that much, but you know, it's that it, 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 the sound sounds impact us like crazy. And that's like a simple way. I think for us to all be able to relate to uh, vibration, vibrational frequency does impact us big time, you know? And I think that it takes some, um, awareness to get to that, but I think that's, that's really cool. And I know you're kind of, I heard you say on another podcast that you're like really into like plants and growing and like, I mean, obviously you wrote the dirt cure, like you're into that stuff. And I love hearing that you have built that you're building that relationship with these plants and that you put a picture of it spliced open, you know, like honoring that, but it just shows that you really do, you know, that you're really living that and then coming out and sharing it with the world. And that's super beautiful. So thank you for sharing that. And I have to ask you a question. So this is going to be a little less like science proven study stuff. Okay. This is just like more, I'm just straight up asking your opinion you can answer however you want, but like, okay, as a neurologist, it's gotta be fascinating for you to like dive into the plant medicine world. Like, I'm just curious, like what comes up, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like what comes up for you? Where does it take you? Or like in terms of like, <laughs> it's gotta be a fascinating experience. I would think someone who has studied neurology at, to the doctorate level to be in a position of kind of unlearning, I would think, <laughs> you know, I was just cu- curious if you could share some of your experience with like, you know, what that has meant to you in terms of how you view reality, <laughs> you know, and the, and the way that our minds work and, um, yeah, just whatever you got there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so unlearning is definitely a, a theme I teach about in all my programs and talk about also in my book and beginner's mind, right? Like, nice. you know, that idea that, you know, the really to to be in mastery, you can't think you know everything. And nope. you never do. We never do. None of us do, um, no matter how much of an expert we are. And I am an expert in many things, and I mm-hmm. always really endeavor to stay in the questions, right? Because, yep. um, and that's just also like, it makes the that. world more fun mm-hmm. to be with awe and wonder and mm-hmm. uh, that level of appreciation all of the time. Mm. Um, but that said, you know, one of the things that I've been led to by the plants, um, I would say is 
really interesting science that helps me understand reality better. And what I mean by that is literally how we perceive reality. So there's a lot of ways that I could unpack this and I kind of want to, I think one of the ways I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it in a more general way. And then I'm going to talk about it in a more technical way. And I think both of them are really interesting. I don't think anyone's going to be yawning. So um, the first is, you know, one of the things that psychedelics do is they interact with, well, they interact with, right, our whole, our whole being, but they're interacting with a part, a constellation of parts of our brain that work together, a system in our brain called the default mode network. Okay. And the default mode network, basically it has a lot of a big role in our ego um, and what makes me, me, right. That feeling. Um, And it's suppressive. It suppresses kind of long old memories, like traumas, right. Emotions that could be disruptive, you know, when we want to be like our little ego selves out in the world being important and things like that. And also surviving, right? You can't just be like weeping about whatever happened in the past and still function. Um, so, so the default mode network is kicks in most when we're in default mode, literally when we're daydreaming, when we're not focused on activity. Mm. And um, one of the things the default mode network is responsible for is something called predictive coding. And I'm going to explain predictive coding in this way. When we go into a new environment, Uh, let's say, you know, a party. Okay. And we look around, we take in the details. We think we've seen all the details, right? It's like, oh, that's my friend. So-and-so these people are talking. They have, you know, have beers. There's music. I like, you know, we, we take Mm -hmm. in the picture and we're like, yeah, I see this whole picture. It turns out that's actually not true. It turns out that uh, what our brains do is gather a few, a few, only a few key details and then fills in the rest of everything from past experience. Now, Mm -hmm. this is great in the sense that it helps us survive because, you know, if there's something dangerous there, we don't want to, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to be like, oh, you know, this and this and this and find a million details and then be like, oh no, you know what I mean? Like there might be too late. So we do need it for survival. And also we want to operate from the wisdom of our past experience. Right. That what we're doing all the time is living a lot from our past selves, right? right? So we're not really always present to the present moment in the ways we think we are. So Mm -hmm. we can bring whatever, maybe we did have a dangerous experience once, you know, in the past. And then we bring that to every new situation that has any kind of inkling of whatever that was, right? At some party, we got in a big fight with our spouse or I don't know. And, you know, so every time, something triggers that you can go in and be like feeling more hostile. You don't even know why, right? You don't even know, like, why are these people? So whatever. And you're like all ready to like rumble and maybe you don't even know why, right? It's happening from the past and you're literally thinking it's in the present. So what psychedelics can do is shut that down. So these ways that we can be stuck in old trauma in old stories Mm -hmm. in who knows, right? That literally embed themselves in our bodies, right? We have Mm -hmm. cellular memory that, you know, we can get into more, but our cells actually hold our experiences in our tissue, in our cells. It's literally in our pathways in our brain, um, keeping us in certain ways supported and educated and in wisdom and at the same time, sometimes stuck. So we turn that off. We take that default mode network, that predictive coding all goes offline when we have a psychedelic experience. Um, if it's a big one, you know, it takes it completely offline. If it's a smaller, sometimes it's like affecting it in different ways, but it's recalibrating our predictive coding. So that's one very nerdy <laughs> science topic that, but I think it's really practical. And then the other way, because you're asking me, how does it affect how I see reality? <laughs> is um, something I actually, and you'll probably enjoy, I think in one of the chapters in my book, I go into um, something called sensory gating. And sensory gating is um, essentially our our windows of perception that exist in our cells. They literally exist in our cells. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like we have auditory sensory gating where, um, and this can be tested. I want to say we, 
we have kind of these complex tests in hospitals that we can test different kinds of sensory gating to diagnose schizophrenia or MS or other kinds of conditions. So this is a, 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 te a technical uh, term actually. And so if you think about what we hear, most of us think, you know, like, okay, my hearing's good. My hearing, I have perfect hearing, you know, whatever. I've got good hearing. Well, actually, you know, if you compare yourself to like a musician, let's say someone who plays the violin, your hearing, your gating is actually much more tamped down mm. than a musician who, you know, is constantly listening. It's just more attuned, right? You have to be more attuned right. to sound. Um, if you are a person with perfect pitch, even more, right? Your sensory mm -hmm. gating is more attuned for your auditory sensory gating. Um, mm -hmm. There are people with neurodivergence, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be ADD, autism, um, whether it be uh, sensory integration disorder, whether it be um, bipolar and all the way at the end of the spectrum, you know, schizophrenia, um, where sensory gating is definitely different, wider and gifted people too are found to have much wider sensory gating. We can modulate our sensory gating. Um, most of us have been educated uh, and conditioned to keep our, our gating very small, our, our windows mm -hmm. of perception. And when I say windows of perception, it's literally on a cellular level, but it's also kind of an, on an esoteric level at the same time, because it's how do we perceive reality? We're educated and, and, and acculturated to really see a very small sliver of reality that's not very mystical right um and and what psychedelics can do what master plants can do um in any dose i would say in my experience is they help us modulate uh if it's a big dose blast open right the, that sensory gating for a period of time and and it will never be exactly the same again right once mm -hmm. it's been opened like that your ability to perceive becomes more malleable and potentially wider, right? It doesn't necessarily stay that way. And we don't necessarily always want it to stay that way. But um, the thing about the way we all walk around most of the time in our society with this very narrow tamped down sensory gating means we, it doesn't mean reality is this little narrow thing we're seeing. It's just like, if you turn down the volume, it doesn't mean the music's not beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So when we open and broaden that sensory gating, it helps us actually perceive more of what is true and real about what we call reality, how we experience wow. reality. Wow. That was like such a more amazing answer than I could have ever imagined. Thank you. <laughs> Glad I asked that. Wow. How awesome for people with, you know, neurodivergence or gifted or, you know, some of these things that maybe they feel like are like wrong with them or something is like, what a shift to look at it that way is, you know, like understanding, taking a look at it through that sensory gating lens is probably pretty cool for a lot of people hearing that. If anybody is who deals with some of those things. And I know for me personally, like I do definitely can say that like my, um, awareness, I just spiritual awareness, awareness of my intuition, awareness of energies around me, of like people of like just in general in life. Like I would say my experience from plant medicines is I definitely feel way more aware in my life than I ever have, you know, and I'm very grateful for that neuroplasticity benefit. Cause I can feel that. Like, it's like after a journey and I'm like you, I don't do it very often anymore, you know, but afterwards I am so grateful. I'm like, man, my mind is like really operating nicely right now. <laughs> like, and it does feel a little easier to change my patterns or like be with myself or just, you know, be that observer. And, oh, I'm so grateful for that. And, um, before we end, I want to let people know, I mean, not only do you have the book, which, um, they can get on your website. Is that the best place you would like to direct people to find that? They can definitely get it on my website at drmaya.com and they can also get it on Amazon. Okay, cool. And I just want to say like, you should really, guys should really check out drmaya.com because you do a lot more than just write these books, girl. You got some cool stuff on here. <laughs> she has a whole certification for becoming a psychedelic informed practitioner. You have this she treat decertification with, you know, I love that. Oh my gosh. Private consultations. You even have astrological readings, which I was like just about to book one with you before. Cause I, I, <laughs> I am curious and all that. I'm not dogmatic about it, but there's, there's 
there's something there for sure. Like there's, if you get deeper into the energetic levels, besides just like the cosmopolitan astrology type stuff, like it's really fascinating. Um, so you have that. And then of course your quantum drops that you talked about, those are all on the website. Um, there's programs, books. I mean, you've been busting ass girlfriend. So thanks for <laughs> showing up to the plate. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We'll link your website. We'll link the books, all of these things in the show notes. Um, any last things you'd like to share with people while you got a mic on you? Um, <laughs> well, thank you for, for that shout out. I appreciate it. And, um, no, I mean, I think, I think I just want to offer my, you know, honoring and admiration for you sharing these mind opening ideas and science to your community. I think it's the most important thing we can do, right? Like we said, mm -hmm. is stay in the questions and be really, really curious. And, right. um, it's hard to do that because the world that we live in is intense and sometimes scary and it makes us just want to kind of stay in in survival mode but um right. you know these kinds of conversations are i think so so important and valuable so thank you yeah being curious instead of like the right wrong dogmatic thinking you know it's just like i'm i'm not saying we're not i'm not trying to prove i'm right about anything i just think these conversations are amazing to have and like especially when we have experts like you who have gone on these huge journeys with it how valuable it's it's i i'm the lucky one here because you guys get to share people listening get to learn and I get to be in the middle of all that and learn everything. So I'm, I'm grateful to be able to be in my role and feel really lucky. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, we'll call it from there.